All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks to those who are here, those who are on Zoom. Um, thank you to Government Relations, who's co-hosting this with us, especially Jamie Gaines and Allison Doyle, who've been very helpful in organizing this. I would not have been able to figure all of these pieces out, so thank you. Um, and today you're gonna to be joining us for a session to learn more about the role of the Health Connector in Mass Health um, in covering the residents of the Commonwealth. So I wanna welcome our presenters today. We have Erin Ryan, um, who is the Government Affairs Manager from the Massachusetts Health Connector. We have Nikki Conti, the Associate Director um, of Public Outreach and Education from the Massachusetts Health Connector. Um, and we also are joined by Joe Pacheco and Amy Arujo um, from the Taunton Mass Health Enrollment Center. Um, so as folks know, uh, Mass Health is the state's Medicaid agency. It covers nearly 1.1 million residents in the Commonwealth. It's also the largest payer for kids in the Commonwealth, covering about 40% um, of kids across the state. Um, also about 40% of our patients at the hospital are Medicaid patients, um, and the hospital has a deep commitment to providing care for all patients who come through its doors. Um, we also partner with Tufts Health Public Plan on a Medicaid ACO plan, Boston Children's ACO. Um, so there's a lot of work that we do partnered with Medicaid. Um, the Health Connector was established in 2006 as a part of mass healthcare reform. Uh, it is the state health exchange or marketplace, um, offers dental and health coverage to individuals of all income levels and also to small businesses. Um, they cover over 291,000 individual health insurance members, nearly 100,000 individual dental members, and nearly 7,000 small business members, as of the last time you reported that publicly. Um, they are two separate agencies, so Mass Health and Health Connector are two separate agencies, uh, but they do work closely together to serve an invaluable role in the Commonwealth to ensure that all who need access to quality, affordable health care have it. Uh, we continue to have high coverage rates and continued focus on access. Uh, in the state of Massachusetts, in large part due to the efforts of these two agencies and the folks on the stage. Uh, I'm personally privileged to have worked with uh, two of these folks, Erin and Nikki, um, and colleagues of Amy and Joe. I know that this will be highly informative. Um, so now I will turn it over first to Nikki. Thanks, Becca. And thank you everyone for joining us here today. I'm just a little bit shorter, so I'm gonna adjust myself here a bit. Um, before I dive into the presentation, I just want to get a general sense um, maybe of how many folks in the audience have ever help, helped a consumer apply for coverage through the online application. All right, we got a couple. Um, can I assume that others maybe, maybe just generally want to gain some more information about our program so you can best direct people? All right, great, fantastic. So I will keep that in mind as I go through these slides. And um, I don't think we mentioned this, but I will go through my section first. Um, then Joe will talk about mass health. Then what we've done in this, pre, um, this presentation it was, is we have a really nice chart um, that's kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of our two, of not our two programs, but our two agencies. We'll step through that and then we'll have time for Q&A. Sound good? Okay, great. So let's get started. So Becca mentioned um, some of this, but I'll just repeat it for folks um, so you have a, a background. So the Health Connector basically is the state marketplace, um, and Mass Health, as she mentioned, is the state's Medicaid program. So our goal today is really to talk to you more about the Health Connector, more specifically to focus on the Connector Care program and talk about eligibility for subsidies, then also talk about um, those individuals that might be eligible for advanced premium tax credits. Um, then Joe's gonna spend time going through Mass Health. We'll do a little comp comparison of the two and then certainly take questions. Okay, so as I mentioned, we are the marketplace um, and we've been around since 2006, uh, the passage of chapter 58 and healthcare reform. Um, and then as the Affordable Care Act was passed, we transformed not only our agency, but our systems to meet those needs. So um, we provide health and dental coverage options to individuals across the state. Um, we also, in addition to offering um, coverage for individuals seeking subsidies, we also um, have a Health Connector for Business program, which we'll talk about. But more, more than not, you've probably heard about our Connector Care program. Um, we've talked about um, folks that have the ability to receive federal tax credits, 
And then just an important thing to note when um, we're thinking about serving small businesses in Massachusetts, we're talking about um, those small businesses that have 50 or fewer employees. So an important thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about what the Health Connector offers. So these are commercial health and dental plans. Um, all of the plans that are available on our website all meet the state and federal requirements. Um, so they meet individual mandate requirements um, as well as federal requirements for coverage. So on slide four, and I'm sure if you don't have access to these slides, you'll be able to get access to them after the presentation. Um, you'll, you can see all of the different carriers that um, are offered through the Health Connector. So for the Connector Care population, they have access to plans through Always Health Partners, BMC, Fallon, Health New England, Tufts Direct. Um, for those seeking coverage um, on subsidized coverage, that is, as well as small group, that's just a little bit, a um, little bit larger, more um, plan options. Um, but you see there's a little bit of crossover as well. So you still see Always Health Partners, Tufts Direct. Um, you can also notice that Tufts Premier is an option, as well as United Healthcare, Harvard Pilgrim. So we will get into the details of these programs a bit more. So um, I'll probably be speaking, for those people that actually help do applications, I'll kind of just be speaking your language, but then I'll also try to uh, be mindful for those folks that maybe aren't as familiar with our online application and try to keep this as, um, as keep the terms uh, as simple as possible. So essentially, um, the, two, the categories that I've discussed here, so connector care, those folks that are eligible for advanced premium, premium tax credits, um, the unsubsidized population as well as small group, um, to qualify for um, any one of these programs, you've got to meet certain, there are certain thresholds, right? So for connector care, we're talking about those households that have individuals with income up to 300% of the FPL. Um, so basically, um, we have these plans, and we'll show you in a few moments a slide that shows the, not only the benefits that are available through the Connector Care Program, but also the low monthly premiums that can be made available to people if they qualify. So, and one way that we help keep those costs down um, is to combine the advanced premium tax credits that those individuals are eligible for. And again, those came from um, ACA. We, and we combine that with state subsidies to offer individuals these really comprehensive plans at a very reasonable cost. So for 2020, you can see premiums are between, or people can choose to enroll in plans with premiums between zero and $130. And again, that's going to be based on income, more specifically based on the plan type that they get determined eligible for. Um, in their service area, people can choose to, from, can choose to enroll in um, one of anywhere from one to four plans, again, depending on where they live. Um, a really key part of this Connector Care program um, is that these plans have no deductibles and really low cost sharing. Okay. Um, so interestingly, you know, we've heard people, you know, anecdotally, we've heard people say, okay, this is great. You know, my income has gone up. Ah, damn it, <laughs> we really loved that, those connector care plans. Do I really you know, do I have to pick something else and roll in something else? Um, because it's really simple to, when you're helping somebody shop for a connector care plan, the comparison is really simple um, and people really like those health plans and really enjoy them or appreciate those lower costs. Um, so for context in 2020, 300% of FPL is around 37,470 for a single person and 72,250 for a family of four. Now, um, as people's incomes go up, um, if somebody has income between three to 400% of the FPL, um, they're not out of luck. So with the pa passage of the Affordable Care Act, what we were able to do is implement these costs, um, implement these uh, or give these advanced premium tax credits to people within that income threshold. So that helps to reduce their costs of their monthly premiums. And then um, since uh, the connector has, since our inception really, we've also offered um, 
unsubsidized uh, commercial health insurance plans to individuals who um, are just, just want to shop through us, want to shop through the marketplace. So if someone doesn't qualify for subsidies, they can come to us, know that they can compare and contrast health insurance plans, see these plans, see the cost, see everything up front, and compare things side by side. So we're really proud to be able to say we've been you know, doing that since 2006 and clearly have been able to um, carry that through um, with the passage, passage of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and lastly, um, just important to note that, and you probably aren't going to see many of these people, but just maybe for your own lives, just know that we do have offerings for small business. Um, so if you're out and about and you're hearing advertisements for Help Connector for Business plans, that's us too. Um, we've relaunched um, a separate platform for um, these small business owners so that they can continue um, to shop through us and also get other types of benefits. But I'm not really, we're not going there today. But just keep that in the back of your mind. All right. So enrollment periods. So we are actually in an open enrollment period right now. So this happens every year. It begins November 1st and it runs through January. And basically what this means is anyone can apply for coverage during this time frame. Anyone that doesn't have coverage can apply for coverage during this time frame and not need a qualifying life event um, to in fact apply and, and enroll. So these people who are applying are going to be starting their coverage beginning on January 1. Um, let's see. If someone um, is, you know, misses this window of opportunity, um, they, they want or need health insurance coverage, they're going to need some sort of quali QLE, qualifying life event, to allow them to enter. So some, we have a full listing here, you can follow this link, but essentially, um, very common things. So if somebody is newly married, if somebody um, has a child, adopts a child, or let's say, see, say they lose um, coverage for some reason, but a loss, of, a loss of coverage is in fact a qualifying life event, and these people can um, apply and get enrolled as soon as, as soon as possible. So we'll talk through some of those, those details as well. All right, so moving on, I mentioned um, connector care plan types a little bit. I mentioned the low cost. I also mentioned that we, in order to get to these low costs, we're taking advantage of the advanced premium tax credits that these people are eligible for, um, as well as state subsidies. We're putting those together. And again, for individuals with income under 300% of the FPL, this is, this is great. Um, th th these are just great savings and um, really beneficial for them. Um, on the right side of the screen, you're seeing um, the connector care plan types. Essentially, depending on the person's income, right, the overall income after they've applied, um, depending on where they fall in terms of FPL, they can qualify to enroll in a health insurance plan at at, at at least this lowest cost. So you can see zero, $45, $87, etc. cetera. Um, someone can, I mean, and so, and I apologize, I'm talking kind of fast because I want to make sure I give my colleague time. Um, so I'll try to slow it down. Um, but what I want to point out here is I've mentioned that depending on where a consumer lives, they may have access to up to four uh, different connector care plans. Um, so not necessarily every one of those plans is going to be at that lowest cost, lowest cost price, but they can choose, right? So some areas actually have two lowest cost plans. So they can choose between those plans, um, or if they want to, for a particular reason, enroll in particular um, carrier, they can in fact do that and pay an additional cost. Um, so the, we talked about the plans having modest co-pays, um, not having any deductibles or co-insurance. The chart on the right is a breakdown of all of the benefits, or excuse me, uh, it's a, we're highlighting some very specific benefits, and then the cost sharing per plan type. Um, so for example, I'm just going to jump to um, an office visit. So if I were looking at a plan type 2A, or to be member 
and they wanted to go to a specialist office visit, it would be $18 copay. So, so pretty good. Um, all right. So I think, I think that's all I want to mention there. Now, going on to slide nine, I just want to get into some more details really about actually um, being eligible for subsidies through the Health Connector. So as you can imagine, um, we, we want to enroll as, as many people as we can, but of course we want, there, there need to be um, filters, right, to um, ensure that we are in fact making this available to those who are eligible. So for um, the Health Connector, for our subsidies, you need to be a resident of Massachusetts, be lawfully present in the US, um, not be incarcerated, um, and this is important, not eligible for other public um, MEC. So what does that mean? We're, we're basically what we're talking about here when we say other plans, uh, other public MEC. Um, if the person is eligible for some type of other state program, so if somebody is eligible for mass health, we're not going to have give them connector care eligibility. If someone's eligible for Medicaid, um, Medicare, where they're not going to be eligible for connector care. Um, you'll also see here that if somebody is enrolled in VA coverage, right, they're not going to have access to our subsidies. So we're really trying to save this program um, for individuals that don't have access otherwise to, um, to um, coverage that meets minimum essential coverage. Also, um, folks should not be eligible for affordable um, minimum value employer sponsored insurance. Um, their income, as we've talked about, has to be under 300% for connector care, um, under 400% for those people who are just getting advanced premium tax credits. Um, and then um, if someone is an American Indian or an Alaska, Alaskan Native, um, they have other special, um, there are special features available to anyone who is an American Indian or Alaska Native, and we can talk about that as well. All right, so to make this a little bit more real, on slide 10, what you'll see are the federal poverty guidelines. Now these change every year. Um, and you'll basically, you can see that, well, the chart is going up to a household of eight, showing you a household of eight. Um, but essentially, um, what we want to just point out here is uh, the connector care eligibility, um, the income thresholds for connector care. And then um, with this kind of addition of allowing individuals with income that go up to 400%, we're able to, you know, give everyone think about it. Well, they are advanced premium tax credits, and I'll talk about that. Um, but it essentially just helps to make the cost of coverage a bit more affordable for folks. Okay. So let's move into coverage for those who qualify for APTC only, or somebody who is seeking unsubsidized coverage. Um, so these advanced premium tax credits, I think it's important to point out that anybody who is getting advanced premium tax credits through the Health Connector, whether they're getting them through the Connector Care Program or they're getting them um, for an APTC only plan, they are agreeing to file and reconcile their taxes each year. So I just wanna kinda just point that out. Naturally, um, health insurance and taxes, it's not like an intuitive thing, these things you know, don't, naturally go together maybe for folks, but it's really important for our membership. Um, we've heard from time to time um, from our partners out in the field that um, it, it's a different, or it's, it's kind of a different, difficult transition for individuals who are typically, um, or maybe have been low, lower income and never have had to file taxes before. And we've said, no, super important, at least if someone is eligible for connector care, um, or has moved from Mass Health into Connector Care, they really need to file their taxes to maintain their eligibility for those subsidies. Now, same is true if somebody is in that three to 400 um, per FPL percent range, we still need those individuals to commit to file their taxes, reconcile their advanced premium tax credits so they continue to be eligible um, for those, um, those tax credits. 
So um, for people who are in that range, or if somebody is um, just seeking unsubsidized coverage, as if you can remember from before, they can choose from um, the nine carriers that we are offering. Um, and depending on where people live, they'll have a subsection of those nine available to them, but they have a different, these folks have expanded choice. Um, I think it's important to just point out here um, that we, you know, we're really thrilled to be able to offer coverage through these leading carriers in Massachusetts. Um, and we are serving approximately half of the Massachusetts unsubsidized non-group market uh, through the Health Connector. So I think that's super important to point out. Um, moving, oh, am I ready to move on? <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna, as you can tell, I, I like the mic. I'll stop for now. Um, I will pass this on to my colleague, Joe, and then we'll be back to um, help answer some questions. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having us. Um, as Becca said, my name is Joe Pacheco. I am the assistant director of the Todd and Mac, and I brought along with me my colleague, Amy Arujo, who is our team manager for our under 65 population. So I will do the first section of this. And then when uh, Nikki comes back up, she will bring Amy with her. Uh, and then I'm going to let Amy take all the questions because I'm in the process of doing Amy's performance evaluation. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, some quick facts for you first. Uh, MassHealth provides the comprehensive affordable health coverage to one in four Massachusetts residents, about 1.86 million. MassHealth covers 40% of the children in the Commonwealth, 60% of disabled residents in the Commonwealth, and 20% of all residents under the age of 65, uh, age 65 or older. Two thirds of our uh, members are in nursing homes. MassHealth covers services comparable to the commercial insurance plans, plus services not covered by the other insurers, the long-term services and support certain behavioral health services. MassHealth comprises approximately 40% of the total state budget and accounts for over 80% of the federal revenue in terms of the reimbursements that we get. So we have some of the universal eligibility requirements kind of piggybacking on what Nikki talked about earlier. Uh, the mass residency, you have to be an applicant as a resident or intends to reside in the Commonwealth. Citizenship or immigration status, uh, you have some of those qualifying um, statuses there, including qualified non-citizen, protected non-citizen, and qualified non-citizen barred. Um, this was uh, one of my favorites too because of the, uh, the acronym, the person residing under the color of law. Um, the first time I saw that, because I came over from DCF, it took me quite some time to, to understand it. Um, social security number, assignment of rights to medical support and third party payments, third party recovery, and the potential sources of health care and utilization of potential benefits. So some of our eligibility requirements for individuals, families, and peoples with disabilities under the age of 65, you have the categorical eligibility requirements. The individual must be included in at least one of the categories below. Um, I'm not going to read them all for you. You can see them all there. Uh, but we also require the financial eligibility requirement. The individual's il income will be determined by the household comp composition, which is the size of the household, the MAGI modified adjusted income, and the tax filing status. So as Nikki said, tax filing is important for us as well. And we're gonna compare that to the annual published federal poverty guidelines. So within MassHealth, we have a bunch of different coverage options, standard, care plus, common health, family assistance, limited, the children's medical security plan and health safety net. The individual factors that we're going to use to determine coverage types often change. And if you have a change in your, in your household status, we require you to report that to us within 10 days. So here's a chart that breaks down uh, some of the categorical, cat categorical categories for you being covered. And it will be broken down on the subsequent slide, but this is just a good visual for you to have. So we break it down by the FPL, the federal poverty level, categorical based upon where you fall in age and any type of uh, medical need, and then your citizenship and immig immigration status. Um, so individuals with breast cancer or cervical cancer, uh, and then the immigration status, citizen, qualified non-citizen, and protected non-citizen, 
just an example of those. And again, we, we break it down. And as you see on the left, the income levels change based upon the category and the citizenship status. Am I going too fast for anybody? No? Okay. So mass health, common health, ages under 65. Same thing again, you have the income level, you have the category level, and the citizenship and immigration status for each of those. They're broken down. Um, premiums on this plan may be assessed for members with income greater than 150% FPL, except for American Indians and Alaskan Natives. The Mass Health Family Assistance Program for ages under 65. Uh, and again, on this one as well, premiums may be assessed for members with income greater than 150 FPL, except for the American Indians and Alaskan Natives. The Health Family Assistance Continued, which is off of what we just came from. Mass Health Family Assistance oh, Continued again. Mass Health Limited, ages 65 and under. Uh, and these are provided coverage for emergency services only. Children's Medical Security Plan, the 300% FPL or less, uh, covering the ages of under 19 and then the citizenship categories. Health Safety Net, 150% and under and then 150% to 300%. Uh, and this covers a pretty big area and including the partial health safety net where there's an annual deductible required. Uh, it's for those who are uninsured and no access to insurance or secondary insurance where they could be enrolled in another plan. Mass Health Plan Enrollment, it's managed healthcare eligible members under 65 having no other health insurance, third party liability including Medicare, you're living in the community and the following types of coverage is stuff that we offer mass health standard common health care plus and family assistance these are some of the plans that we offer and it's important to note on these plans as well the geographically based i believe it's 25 mile radius so you need to be within a 25 mile radius of these plans to sign up for any particular one so when people are going to sign up for it it's going to be based upon their uh, zip code where they reside in So when to enroll, and right now we're in open enrollment period. Um, members determine eligible for Mass Health and are able to enroll in a managed care plan have 14 days to pick their plan. If they don't pick it, we'll pick it for them automatically. Um, here are some of the links to find the plan and to enroll, or you can call customer service uh, at that 1-800 number. Um, it's important to note as well that you can change a plan during the annual selection period only throughout the year, otherwise you cannot change it. So once you pick that plan, you're locked in it for that year. The accountable care partnership plans, you have to choose a PCP within the accountable care partnership plan network. Uh, and as you can see in the bottom right, it speaks to the geographic requirements uh, that you have to pick somebody that's in the service area that's covered by that ACO. Uh, and you're picking it during the fixed enrollment period. Uh, Outside of that, you cannot change it. Primary care ACOs, you have to choose a PCP within the primary care ACO network. Uh, managed care eligible members, a given primary care ACO may not have PCPs available near you where a member lives, in which case they cannot enroll in that. Uh, so really wanna emphasize the, the zip code uh, requirements. Managed care organization, uh, you have to choose a PCP within the MCO network. During the plan selection period, members can select MCOs directly. They also can select or choose to be assigned a PCP. Uh, during the member's fixed enrollment period, you cannot change their plan, but can choose different PCPs in the MCO network at any time. Primary care clinician plan, you have to choose a PCP within the PCC network. Uh, members in the PCC plan can change to an MCO or an ACO at any time, and members can change their PCC in the PCC plan at any time. Managed care eligible members and the PCPs who are part of an ACO will not be available as the PCCs in the PCC plan. It's a lot, right? Yeah. Plan selection period and fixed enrollment. Members are enrolled in a Mass Health MCO or ACO health plan, and you'll have a 90 day plan selection period every year. During this time, the members can enroll or switch their health plans for any reason. After that 90 day period has ended, you're in the fixed enrollment period at which point you can't change your plan. 
When you're in the fixed enrollment period, you cannot move to another health plan until your next plan selection period and mass, unless Math Health determines that one of the exceptions apply. Um, and that link when you guys are provided this PowerPoint will get you to what the exceptions are. Or you can ask Amy after. Uh, is this what you guys are doing with us now, Nikki? Okay. All right. So this is why we're here together. So basically, if a consumer, hold on, let's just move that up. Can you guys see that? Okay. So basically, basically a consumer is going to one, one place, one application. They don't need to know what they qualify for. Um, essentially, they just need to answer the questions on the application um, as best as they can, what, as best as they know at that point in time in their life. And what the system will do is at the end, it will give a program determination based on all of the information that's shared. Um, so I think I just, we want to point out at least the slides are reminding us to point out that yes, we work very closely together, but we are two distinct state agencies, um, different call centers, different staffing structures, different policies. But really, um, I think when the Health Connector was for, first formed, I used to go out and give presentations with other Mass Health staff and I'd say, we're so close, it's like we're cousins, we're sister agencies, we, you know, individuals. Um, we share the same goal. You got it. We share the same goal. We want people to um, enroll in the coverage that they're eligible for. Um, we really just want to help your Massachusetts, quite frankly. I'm coming, we're coming from another meeting with another state agency who was asking us, like, what is your goal? And we're like, just uh, healthier, healthier communities, right? Um, so what we're hoping for through the system is that as individuals' circumstances change in their life, if their income goes up or it goes down, they're able to move um, easily through our programs. Um, and we realize, we acknowledge that it is a little bit confusing for people. Um, we've heard, you know, people call me and say, well, you're a mass health, right? Or you're the mass health connector that says so right there. And we're like, no, 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 we, we, it's mahealthconnector.org. It's for, the application is for Massachusetts residents. Mass health is separate. Health Connector is separate, and we've got two different sets of rules. So I think that's the big takeaway. I and the conclusion comes in is that households can be, the same household can have Health Connector members and Mass Health yeah. enrolled members in it. So it, it does lend to that confusion easily, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, so we want to be mindful. We want to be mindful of that as mm -hmm. um, you're helping consumers or you're even explaining con to consumers on our behalf that there are these programs available to them. So um, we're super excited to have this comparison for you. Um, I'm going to hand this to my colleague and be right here by her side to point out the connector <laughs> differences, but I'll give this So all to for you. Mass Health, the eligibility factors, and, and as she said, that we do share um, the universal requirements. So for citizenship and immigration status, eligibility for Mass Health depends on the um, on the immigration status as well as the length of time of the status. So depending on what they have for or qualify for immigration, um, programs are available for undocumented individuals or otherwise not lawfully present as well to be here. So Mass Health will help out with that. And with the connector. Yep. So with the connector, where if somebody is lawfully present in the U.S., that's the only factor we're looking for. Um, and if somebody is not lawfully present, unfortunately, they can't purchase health insurance coverage through the health connector through the marketplace. So I just some I know that we've heard from a lot of folks who've asked about, you know, um, someone who's undocumented. Are you sure they can't buy through you? And unfortunately, that is that is not the case. Um, as far as residency is concerned, both Mass Health and the Health Connector share the same. You have to be a resident of Massachusetts in order to have it. Um, so the intention to reside in Massachusetts, it, Massachusetts is critical. You have to want to. You have to want to be here. So we can help you out. You got it. Um, incarceration. Um, you can't be in jail in order to qualify for a mass health benefit, um, with the exception for mass health as far as inpatient. So if somebody needs to do a, receive any kind of inpatient services, um, mass health can make an exception for that. 
Okay, and for the connector, it's if someone um, is confined but not convicted. So if it's pre-trial, they may be determined eligible. Um, and this is where we kind of go move differently as far as mass it. health and the health connector. So for mass health, uh, we do look at your income and kind of break it down in a different way. Mass Health is going to look at your income on a monthly basis. So, you know, we know that people's income can change. We know that different scenarios come up. So we're going to look at you um, for Mass Health programs by the month and try to help determine that as well. Um, we still use the federal poverty level standards that um, are updated every single year as we talked about. For us, it's typically March 1st is when those uh, income standards are changed and updated um, with a small increase of usually around 2%, um, but we take all of that in consideration. And this is um, an important distinction for us. So we're using annual projected income. So basically when you're sitting with a Health Connector member, they need to, um, especially, you know, and this can be difficult sometimes if somebody doesn't have, uh, they have a couple of different jobs, nothing standard. Um, they need to, at the, as best as possible, project what their income is going to be for the entire year ahead. Um, also, we use the same FPL standards. But an important distinction is that we're going to use the standards that are in effect at the start of open enrollment for an entire year. So for example, we're going to use 2019 standards that are in effect on November 1 when open enrollment begins, and we're going to use that for 2020 eligibility. Um, access to insurance. Um... If you are in a Mass Health program, Mass Health is considered the payer of last resort. So there is different programs that we offer. If you have access to other health insurance, we need to know that. You more than likely should be enrolled in that. But we do have this amazing program called Premium Assistance that has helped many people and households make that transition and make it affordable for them. So we do help out with that. And it is important that you are enrolled in that other insurance that you have access to. We hear often that, you know, their insurance through their company that they work for is incredibly expensive and they can't afford it. But Mass Health does help to make that affordable and help make that part of their budget and something that they can have control in. Yeah. And on our side, um, I think it's just uh, important to note here is, and, and I had mentioned this before, if somebody has access to other coverage, if they have access to other coverage, that's going to block their eligibility, um, in particular for subsidy. Um, and I had mentioned already, if someone has Medicare, they're not going to be eligible for um, a health connector plan or connect, excuse me, a subsidized health connector plan. Mm -hmm. Um, and this other topic here, it says Mass Health requires information about non-custodial parents of children applying. So what that means is um, often we have different types of family groups and composition. So if there is uh, one per parent household, then we need information about the other parent that's not in the household. That's what we mean by the non-custodial parent. Um, so there's normally a primary caregiver or parent in the household. We need the information about the other component there. Okay. And um, just generally, I think it's worth noting here that if someone has, um, someone is an American Indian or has Alaskan native status, that has to be verified um, before cost sharing reductions for certain services become available to them. So it's just a, a little extra piece of information we want to, we want to give you. So moving on to the enrollment comparisons here, for the individuals can apply and enroll in Mass Health at any point throughout the year, depending again on their categorical eligibility and their income eligibility. There's lots of different variables. Members in ACOs may switch ACOs once per year during their plan selection period, and there. Uh, there are, however, exceptions to that fixed enrollment period. So we do have a fixed enrollment period for the, the plan selection, but depending on when you actually start in the Mass Health program, that can change or if there are other outlying scenarios. Okay. And then on the Health Connector side, I think it's just important to note that somebody can apply any time. 
Um, however, in terms of enrollment, they can only do that during open enrollment or if they've had a particular qualifying life event that makes them eligible. Um, you heard me say we're in open enrollment right now, um, but what I haven't mentioned is a special enrollment period. So if somebody does have a qualifying life event, they've got 60 days to act and then enroll. Mm -hmm. um, as far as enrollment timelines for Mass Health, basically once you apply, we will go back 10 days retroactively. So if you apply today on the 21st of November, your effective date for whatever you're mass health eligible for would go back to November 11th. So that way we can help any previous dates of service that might be in question or concerns of yours. Yep. And so for Health Connector enrollment, we are enrolling um, prospectively. So it's the first of every month. So coverage always starts on the first. Um, and you can see the rest of that there. Let's see. Yes, you can see that there. <laughs> For in Mass Health and premiums, premium assistance payments begin the month the Mass Health premium assistance eligibility determinations or in the month that the health insurance deductions begin, um, whichever is there. So it just kind of depends as far as the time frames. And as I mentioned, so if uh, payment, excuse me, if the um, enrollment is beginning on the first of each month, someone's going to need to make their premium payment prior to the, the enrollment becoming effectuated. So um, you'll see the example here. If somebody was enrolling for December coverage, we would have we would need the payment by 11:23. So we hope this little comparison is helpful to you, and we're hoping that. This chart is super helpful to you. Just in, um, I'm just thinking about time. Maybe if there's anything particular you might want to point out, maybe we'll just highlight a couple other things and then mm -hmm. we'll get to questions. Sound good? I don't know if there's anything in yeah, particular. No. Is there anything on the other end? Hold on, we're going to skim and see if there's anything super. Oh, this is, this is, um, right, this Joe had mentioned this. this mm -hmm. is, yep. So as far as reporting any changes for MassHealth, because again, we are looking at income and households on that monthly basis, we need to know about any kind of changes within a household within 10 days. So if it's a change of address, there is a change in your household as far as adding or removing family members, we should know that so that way we can then recalculate and make a more appropriate determination for your household based on that change. You got it. And ours is slightly different here. You can see we need um, we need to know about a change within 30 days. Um, and then I'll let you do eligibility. Yeah. And then an <laughs> eligibility verification. So when we share the same system, so when we, for example, put through an application and we need income verification, we both need 90 days. Yeah give 90 days in order to, for the household to respond. And that way we can go ahead and make sure that the uh, program determination is more finalized for the individuals at that point. So you do want to get that in, especially for income. You got it. You got it. And on our, our side, like as, um, as my colleague mentioned, we, they, people have 90 days, but I think it's just important noting for health connector coverage, somebody might get determined eligible for a benefit um, and even enroll before the proof has been received. Mm -hmm. Okay, so slight difference. Um, so we hope this chart's helpful and probably a really good takeaway mm -hmm. when you um, get back to your desks. Becca, we are ready for you. <laughs> All right. All right, well, thank you guys so much. I'm gonna play with this screen for a second. All right. Um, so we have a few questions from folks online. We also have microphones in the room if folks have questions. I just wanna thank you all for waiting through what I know is really complicated um, rules uh, around health insurance eligibility in the Commonwealth. I think that things I took away before we dive into questions are, first of all, that there are people like you and there are places to go for help. So many of you in this room may have been trained in this. You may want to know everything about this. You may not want to know everything about this. But at the end of the day, you know, we have financial counselors here at the hospital. We have um, enrollment navigators in the community. We have certified application counselors in the community. We have enrollment centers. Um, and so there's a lot of help to be had. You don't need to know everything. You just need to know the right place to go to get help. Okay. Um, second is that there's one application, mahealthconnector.org. Um, so that's easy. You don't need to know what people are eligible for. The system will just tell you. Um, third, you are separate entities, but you work together. I think there's a lot of confusion over, well, this person has Tufts Direct. They're a mass health patient. 
Um, and I think that that can be very frustrating when you're trying to wade through and figure out what coverage patients have. Um, so I think that's a helpful and important distinction, um, that there are more options than just mass health for subsidized coverage. There's also connector care, though for kids especially, mass health tends to be um, a bigger payer, um, and that there are kids-specific rules. Um, so we always keep our eye out for this here, um, but just want to make sure that you know we will continue to call that out for you all. Um, I don't know if I introduced myself at the beginning because I was in an, a little flustered, um, but I'm Becca Diamond. I work for the Depart Department of Accountable Care and Clinical Integration, which we lovingly call DACHI. Um, we will be posting all of this information on our intranet page, um, and so folks can have this information, and we'll also have contact information um, for various modes of help, too. Um, so with that, um, if there are questions in the room, we can take them. We have microphones we can pass to you. Otherwise, I have some questions from folks online. Okay. Um, so one question um, has to do with alternatives to COBRA. Um, and so I think um, a group of folks that are interested in this session are folks from our HR division. And so i um, wondering if you can kind of walk through what other alternatives there are to COBRA for folks who fall off coverage for them. Fantastic. I think it's on. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so yes, the health connector, um, health connector plans definitely are an option or an alternative to COBRA coverage. We know how expensive um, that coverage can be for folks. So what we try to encourage people to do is um, if they are losing access to their employer's coverage, um, they can, in fact, apply for and enroll in connector, health connector coverage, choose the plan, as long as they do it before they enroll in their COBRA coverage. Um, so it gets a little bit tricky. Um, technically, they're not supposed to drop COBRA to then, in fact, um, enroll in connector coverage. I believe, and I can follow up on this, I think it, during open enrollment, they're able to, in fact, um, come into us if they were in COBRA. Yeah. And I think it's just great to point out because COBRA can be so expensive. You got it. Um, so it's just nice to offer other opportunities for folks. It's many may want to stay on their employer coverage for a little longer, but some may want um, a less expensive opportunity. Yep. And Becca, before we move on, I think for the HR folks in the room, and I can share the link with you, we've got some really good informational flyers um, that you can you know, distribute to staff as part of like their departure packet. Um, so it's good, helpful information to have. Great. Yep. Um, okay, so this is for my mass health friends. So um, uh, as I mentioned before, we manage uh, an ACO, Boston Children's ACO, about 100,000 100, patients, but we see patients from all ACOs as a, a quaternary care center for kids in the Commonwealth. Um, and I'd love to hear from you kind of what are the, the biggest challenges or changes you've seen related to ACOs um, and what kind of words of advice may you pass on based on your experience since March of 2018? My advice is research. Find out. Uh, there's a, a great website. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but it's called MassHealthChoices.com. Uh, and you can go right on. You can go on right now. Uh, it is super helpful. It's super informative. And you can actually en enroll in a plan right there online. Um, but it tells you, based off of your zip code, what you'd be eligible for and even breaks down for the plans all the different services that are attached to each one. So they, it does a great side-by-side -side comparison. So you, the individual can find out what's going to work best for them because everybody has individual needs. It might be that they need to see certain doctors or that the health care, the health, um, like the gym memberships would be more important to them. So that's a great tool to help as far as comparing the actual plans and even finding doctors that are available to them within their area and felt telling them who is accepting new patients, who is where and what location to them in their specialty. So it's a great tool to use in order to do that, but it's important to do that research and make sure they get enrolled in the right plan. Great. Thank you. Um, so we recently, and I think folks here may have been here, we recently had a session on immigration and some of the changes um, related to immigration, particularly happening at the federal level, um, and wanted to know from you all, given that you know there's a diverse immigrant population that gets their coverage through the Health Connector and Mass Health, um, whether you've seen any impacts to members' coverage or concerns from members, um, and if so, kind of what are the Health Connector and Mass Health doing to 
to help clarify some of those things. Well, as far as Mass Health is concerned, come in, come in. It doesn't matter. Just come in and see what we can do for you. And that's, I see more of the fear that people have coming in and concern that something's going to happen. And, and as far as I'm concerned, it's not. Um, there's not the changes that are happening aren't impacting their eligibility with mass health programs. Um, but I, I definitely see more um, people are hesitant to kind of share and come forth. And we just want to make sure that they get the help that they need or get the services that they are potentially entitled to and not go without. I mean, we want to make sure, like Nikki was saying earlier, that we want to make sure they're healthy and they can get what they need. And I think from the Health Connector's perspective, um, I think we've learned once the rule was um, finalized, there were, well, from our connector care population, um, there would be very, very few people who um, qualified for connector care who would ever, in fact, be um, negatively impacted by enrolling into connector care. Unfortunately, what we're hearing from the field, from our navigators, as well as other sisters, is about about this fear. Um, I think there is some great, there are some great resources on the Health Connectors website. I think if you are talking with anyone and they're feeling any fear about their particular situation, because immigration gets very complicated very quickly, I mean, it's very specific to that, you know, individual or that family's circumstance. I'd recommend that they um, look into some resources on our website. Um, we have a link to uh, Healthcare for All, also uh, Mass Law Reform Institute. Um, so we've got some great phone numbers, uh, great phone, great resources, phone numbers to direct people to. Um, and then for the financial counselors in the room or or online um, during the uh, and you'll know you'll know these acronyms if you're a financial counselor. Um, the MTF. Uh, meetings that were held in January, Healthcare for All actually came out and gave a very good presentation on um, public charge. So there's an, um, we're here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you can download that presentation or I can share that link with you as well. And um, people can just kind of go through it because they've tried to really simplify it. Yeah, no, they did a, a phenomenal job. They were here for that exact okay. presentation. Perfect. So I'm glad we're all on the same page. Yes. Um, any questions from the audience before? Wonderful. Sorry, can Hi, I'm Tanisha. I'm actually one of the financial counselors here at Children's. With immigration, if a child is, say, living in both places part of the year, would they be eligible because they have a parent in DR and a parent here? And say they come here perhaps maybe like for the summer, like when they're not here in school. Would they be eligible for mass health? That's a good one. <laughs> it's tough. I, I've actually it is had tough, a mom it? Um, try to apply and she needed to give like school information or prove that her kids are residents here, which she wouldn't have that information because they don't go to school here. So what would she possibly be able to give to show that her kids are partly residents here. Okay, so they, they need to be a resident of Massachusetts, okay? For children, we don't normally ask for proof of residency, um, but it, the intention uh, should be here, and especially because, I, I mean, we're servicing Massachusetts. Um, so if they are residing here, we don't ask for proof of residency for children. So they, they should be a resident of Massachusetts. If they're re residing in two different places, obviously the case would, should be closed because they're not here, but you know they should be a resident of Massachusetts in order to partake the services that they are needing at the time. So they would need to be a resident full time? If they, we, we're in, we don't typically ask like the time period, but if the intention is to reside in Massachusetts and it's indicated that they're a resident of Massachusetts, we don't ask for proof of residency for a child. But if the, oftentimes, for example, um, we'll have parents come in and say, well, you know, I'm here for two weeks or, you know, my child's going to be here for a month. You're not really a resident, you're visiting. I know, I guess the question is, is what qualifies as being a resident if they're only here? partial time, um, say like six months out of the year or? 
Well, I mean, if, if they were looking to prove that, I mean, I would see about doctor's records. Um, there's lots of things that we can take into consideration as far as saying that they do reside here in Massachusetts or they're intending to. Um, but as far as needing to verify a child's residency, we just need them to state that they are residing in Massachusetts. Well, they, they were asked for proof. And for a child or for the for parent? For the child that they live here. And I'm, I'm like, like what? Like, I mean, I, it's not like they're going to be listed on a lease or, you know what I mean? Like, what Can't, kind of proof could possibly yeah. be given? Can't one form of proof be a signed affidavit? Right. But yeah. it, again, that would be the adults that have that. The pa parents are typically the ones that are asked for the proof, not the children. So that's why I'm kind of a little bit confused about that. Did, was it somebody specifically or from the, or is it from the system, like a letter saying that they needed to do that? Well, we actually called um, to try to apply for them. And that's what was asked of us to prove that they, like some kind of school documentation at the end. And I explained, I'm like, was there some sort of here. custody issue involved in that? No, there's no custody issue. They, they live in DR with dad part of the year. Mom lives here and they're with her um, vacations and summers. And So maybe what we can do is we can um, connect you afterwards so we can maybe get some more specific information on the case. Okay. Because um, I think that's a tough one. We, we went through that's it. Proof. That kind of threw me off. I'm like, um, yeah, what do you prove with a uh, sure. So why don't we, we yeah, let's like follow up. Outlying if that's circumstances. Okay. Um, but we don't ask residency or proof of residency for children. So I, 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 we can, I can find out more about that. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good question. Um, other questions from folks? If not, I have one more. We have two minutes. Um, so we got a question about children with chronic disability and medical complexity. Um, is there information to specific to applying for mass health or mass health secondary uh, for, disa for disabled kids um, that I can give to patients when parents ask? And what are the income guidelines? So for disability for both children and adults, um, there's no income guidelines. Okay, so they could be you know, a thousand percent of the federal poverty level and still be potentially eligible for a program um, based off their disability. What we do need is proof of the disability, either federally disabled or through Massachusetts. So if they do not have federal disability, they can apply for disability for, through the state of Massachusetts. So that way we can help with that and help them achieve a richer benefit. Yeah, and I would just add that um, the Department of Accountable Care and Clinical Integration, still very much a mouthful, but I'm going to keep saying it. Um, we um, do provide some information uh, to folks here and through the PPOC on disability benefits, so we can make sure that we make those available um, to you all specifically for, for mass health patients, um, because we know that we see so many of these acute patients here at Children's. Okay, if there are no other questions... Um, I want to thank our presenters today. Thank you guys so much for coming in. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you to all those who came and those on Zoom. All right.